Rising cost of living remaining one of the biggest challenges for the South African consumer and high interest rate environment being at the center of that distress. That is, of course, despite a monetary policy tightening being halted twice since the consecutive hikes from November to fight high inflation. Central Bank Governor Lesitsa Kanyako joins us in studio. An absolute pleasure to have you in our studios. It's a challenging time, but also... Governor, let me maybe ask about uh, whether the central bank at this point is seeing the benefits of the aggressive stance when it came to monetary policy tightening. I, I wouldn't call our uh, actions aggressive. Uh, we started um, tackling inflation uh, from uh, November 2021. Uh, the steps were very measured, uh, cognizant of the challenges that the South African economy uh, uh, was facing mm. um, and I think that what is uh, have been clear to us were that South Africans were under pressure from the rising cost of living and that rising cost of living come, came as a result of inflation that was climbing and South Africans were correctly raising issues about the rising cost of food prices, the rising cost of fuel and the rising uh, prices uh, of other uh, goods and services in mm. uh, the South African uh, economy, and it is for that reason that the central bank had uh, to act. Uh, but we consider we, have, we would take it that the measures that we had taken were actually very uh, measured rather than aggressive. Much of that climate, Governor, hasn't changed much. The real lived experience of South Africans is that uh, of serious distress as a result of the rising cost of living. When you indicate that uh, the stance of the Reserve Bank in this regard has been measured uh, when it uh, pertains uh, to monetary policy tightening, some South Africans could argue that it does not feel like that in our pockets. Well, uh, uh, let's just uh, uh, get things clear here. Mm -hmm. the the, 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 the action of adjusting the monetary policy stance is the medicine that is being administered to a particular disease. The disease here uh, is inflation. And if we look at what inflation had meant for many South Africans, Statistics South Africa releases data which uh, divides South African income earners into 10 different uh, categories, we call them deciles. The decile one and decile two, which are the low income earners and people living on grants, had experienced inflation uh, of about 9.4%. Mm -hmm. Yet the most recent inflation reading is 4.8%. The people who are the high income earners, that is decile nine to uh, decile 10, those people had experienced inflation of about 4.3%. Mm. Now, I think by now you get the picture mm. that inflation actually hurts the people with low incomes far more than the people with, uh, with high incomes. Then it goes without saying that any government serious about protecting the poor and low income earners have got to be serious about tackling inflation. Mm. In uh, the South African context, the institution in government tasked with the responsibility of managing inflation is the South African Reserve Bank. Mm -hmm. And the tools that we deploy, the most effective of which is the repo rate, had to be calibrated to deal with that. And that is the stance that, uh, that we have taken. Yes, the medicine is not nice. Yeah. Uh, it can be bitter. Uh, but if the patient does not take this medicine, the patient might end up in the intensive care unit. Hmm. There's been critique at the same time by some analysts and economists that uh, maybe South Africa should be considering another measure and manner of uh, inflation targeting and dealing with uh, the impact of high inflation. How have you responded to some of the, that particular critique with South Africa and the argument being we are a developing economy as opposed to our peers in the U.S.? Well, uh I hear the cries of South Africans, and the cries of South Africans that I hear are not what those the analysts you are citing are talking about. In your intro, what you are talking about is that South Africans are feeling the pressure of the rising cost of a living. Mm. That is the cry of South Africans. Is so when you say that we should be considering other measures of inflation, I'm not sure what that mm -hmm. actually means mm -hmm. because what South Africans are telling us is. Food prices are rising, transport uh, uh, costs are rising, 
the price of other goods and services uh, is rising. That is the pressure they, they are feeling. Mm. So inflation is eroding the buying power of the income of South Africans. South African Reserve Bank has a duty to protect that buying power. And protecting that buying power means that we have got to deploy our tools to tackle mm. uh, inflation. And that is exactly what we had had, uh, we had, had to do. Developing countries, uh, should developing countries be uh, taking a different stance? Well, advanced economies have got citizens who are earning more mm -hmm. than our citizens. I have just given you the picture yeah. that inflation affects those at low income earners more than those with high income earners. Then it goes without saying mm -hmm. that a developing country has got to bring its inflation down, failing which its citizens have got a right then to say governments are failing them by not tackling inflation. We've seen inflation gradually drop. Uh, is it at a comfortable pace uh, at which we are seeing it at? Because now it, uh, Governor, it sits well within the Reserve Bank's uh, target range of between 3 to 6 percent. But is that enough? Uh, you've indicated previously that uh, the pain may not be over just yet when it comes uh, to tightening. Well, the, the, the point about the inflation is as follows. And I, I, I'm just looking at the, the, the picture behind you, mm -hmm. and it just shows inflation, and the arrow is pointing up. Mm. Is that when it went up, it went up so rapidly, and when it was coming down, it was coming down, so it, like, it went out like it is in a lift. But when it was coming down, it was more like an escalator. It was coming down mm -hmm. uh, gradually until we saw the three most recent readings of inflation where inflation came down to 5.4 then it came down to 4.7 and it ticked up a bit uh, to 4.8 mm. it is closer to where we would like to see it we would like, prefer to see inflation at uh, around 4.5 uh, a percent so we have had two good readings of uh, inflation yeah. uh, take it that the, uh, the summer might be here uh, we have seen one or two swallows uh, for us to be convinced that summer has finally arrived, we have got to see more swallows in the sky. Then we will know that inflation, uh, uh, that uh, summer has arrived. Mm -hmm. So what does that actually mean in terms of inflation? We have got to be seeing that consecutively inflation is sustainably closer to the 4.5 percent that we aim for within that 3 to 6 percent range. Then we would know that we have actually conquered this monster called inflation. Was that at the core of, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, Governor, uh, the uh, Monetary Policy Committee members not agreeing unanimously with regards to the second pause uh, in uh, monetary policy tightening this time around? Well, um, we have had two consecutive uh, pauses. And um, the Monetary Policy Committee uh, is a very robust uh, committee. Mm -hmm. and, um, and people change views from meeting to meeting based on data and their assessment of what that data uh, actually, uh, actually means. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, sometimes you would find that somebody who had argued that you should not change interest rates in one meeting, in the next meeting they might say that we think that we should change, uh, we should change interest rates. Mm -hmm. What is in no doubt is that the committee applies its mind effectively based on the information uh, at, its, uh, at its disposal. And um, we do not take pleasure in South Africans uh, being in pain because interest mm -hmm. rates are uh, elevated. It's just that. The yeah. only way in which we can tackle inflation from a central bank perspective is to deploy uh, the tools that we have uh, at our uh, disposal. And it's not just like it's just in South Africa. Mm -hmm. The world over, actually, central banks have indicated that interest rates are going to be high for a longer period yeah. of time than the market is actually expecting. And that is because inflation has become a global problem. Hmm. What is that anticipation? Higher interest rates for longer? We've heard from the U.S. Uh, Federal Chair Jerome Powell just recently, as well as Janet Yellen, indicating the exact same statement that we heard from you at the last uh, MPC outcomes. Well, uh, inflation is eating the income of South Africans. Mm -hmm. 
the central bank has got to be vigilant to that and protect the income uh, of South Africans. Inflation has declined, but the job is not yet done. Mm. We have got to see that inflation is sustainably uh, staying within the target range and closer to the midpoint of our inflation target range. Then we would know that at that time the job is done. As it stands now, uh, the job is not yet done. So the outlook in terms of further interest rate hikes in 2023 are you able to take us into your confidence in that regard we are sitting in october we're crossing fingers that maybe there'll be a third pause well i i, I, do, not, I, I do not know what i do know is that there was a pause in september mm. there was a, a pause in july we are guided by data we would look at the data that uh, that comes uh, that comes uh, 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 since our previous meeting, mm -hmm. uh, we have pointed out that there are particular risks to the inflation uh, outlook. Amongst those risks is what is happening with the oil price, mm. uh, what is happening with uh, food prices, and there are uh, fears that uh, the weather patterns might, we might actually experience an El Nino, which could mean that food prices uh, uh, would change their downward trajectory that we had seen mm. and start to uh, tick up. Uh, we had seen that um, the currency has uh, uh, weakened, and we had said that uh, that remains a risk. And the currency is affected by the global uh, factors. And uh, as the uh, U.S. Uh, tightens policies, and as we have seen, whether it is Europe that has tightened policy, global financial conditions remain tight. Okay. And with global financial conditions being tight, capital flows to where it can get the best returns. And the advantage that many emerging markets had over the advanced economies mm -hmm. uh, in the past um, uh, year, that advantage seems to be narrowing as the advanced economies had actually increased rates faster mm -hmm. than what emerging market economies like South Africa have done. Global risks at play, but on the domestic front, load shedding is also an issue and a threat for inflation. How does the Reserve Bank look at that particular development and maybe urge and nudge that this matter be resolved in South Africa? We're going on more than two decades of the same issue. Well, the, uh, the, uh, uh, load shedding had been a threat not just to inflation. It's been a threat to, to growth, uh, too. Um, uh, we expected that if we didn't have load shedding uh, that we have had, that this economy would have grown in excess of 2% this year. Mm -hmm. We would only grow by 0.7% uh, this year, is the impact uh, of uh, load shedding. Uh, what we hadn't been able to uh, discount or quantify much earlier had been the impact that load shedding has on uh, inflation. And this is how the thing would go. Think of a farmer mm. who produces milk or uh, produces vegetables and so forth. Mm. If they cannot store their produce sustainably in fridges, mm. in controlled temperatures, if that cannot be done and they lose that produce, they have got to recover that cost from somewhere, yeah. and they are going to recover it from you and I, and that would mean that they are charging us, uh, they are charging us more. But sometimes they might still be able to uh, preserve that stuff, but only to find that they are not able to take it to market because we have got logistical constraints. Mm. So it's not just load shedding. So it's the logistical constraints and the load shedding that impacts on both growth and on. Uh, price, uh, on price uh, 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 formation. What we have actually seen has been that South African businesses had started to invest in alternative uh, power. So right. embedded generation, um, uh, renewables and all of that uh, stuff uh, are coming on board and actually mm -hmm. have been the key drivers of uh, investment that uh, we have seen. And that is good because it means that there is more electricity added uh, on uh, to the grid. But this is also a cost to mm. the businesses. Mm. And the businesses are going to try and recover that somehow. And it, they would tend to pass that uh, to you uh, and I. And so we have got to be 
resolving those issues. And you might have heard the Reserve Bank talk about the structural constraints and that we actually need the structural reforms. Amongst those is the logistics framework and the, uh, the supply of electricity. The medium-term budget policy statement is coming up in November, Governor. Mm. The key areas of focus in that particular event, what are they? Because the economic situation has changed since we heard from the finance minister in February. Yeah, well, uh, the MTBPS is on the 1st of, um, uh, of November. Uh, the Minister of Finance is very accessible. Get him into the <laughs> studio to talk to you about it. Tax revenue for the South African Reserve Bank. Uh, where are you with uh, the expectations? Um, it is uh, already noted that uh, we are unlikely to hit the targets that uh, we had hoped for. And we've seen that uh, there were surprises in the previous uh, tax revenue that had been collected. But because of the rising cost of living in South Africa and the impact on businesses, the picture is slightly changing. Without a doubt, the economy is very different from uh, what the National Treasury expected in uh, uh, February. Uh, the approach that we take uh, as the Reserve Bank is that we take whatever the Treasury gives us as given. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not try and, uh, as, and second guess them. And there is a reason for that. Mm -hmm. um, if you ask the, uh, the National Treasury, the MPC is coming uh, in November, what do you think? Mm. They will tell you, go and speak to the, uh, to the Reserve Bank. Mm. And so, as a result of that, we also do not talk about what the National Treasury is going to be doing and what their expectations are with revenue and uh, expenditure. Mm. Uh, we do watch the fiscal stance and we have actually had said that the fiscal stance have got implications for monetary policy mm -hmm. and that is why we constantly are in engagement with the Treasury to understand where they are going with the fiscal uh, trajectory. Absolutely fair and uh, it also then directly speaks to how independent all these bodies that need to be including the Reserve Bank but there's commentary on the side of uh, the social discourse uh, be it political parties or trade unions that say it does not necessarily seem like uh, there is a singing from the same hymn book. How do you respond to that? that particular level of criticism that would seemingly be on the political side of the spectrum? Well, we might be singing different voices, but the hymn book is the same. And um, uh, the Minister of Finance and I interact uh, all the time. Our teams interact all the time. We have got standing structures between the National Treasury and the Reserve Bank mm -hmm. uh, that engage on a constant uh, basis to make sure that we are speaking uh, in the same language. Mm -hmm. I must say that in the case of the bank, uh, it's easy uh, because uh, it's uh, the governor and the deputy governors and we run an institution. Fiscal policy is a different ball game. Yeah. It's not just the minister of finance and his treasury team. They must go to cabinet. They must convince mm -hmm. the other ministers about the stance that they are taking. So, uh, fiscal policy is a little bit of a challenge compared to a monetary policy, but be that as it may, whatever comes out, uh, the Minister of Finance, the Treasury engages with the uh, Reserve Bank to make sure that uh, we might be singing with different voices, but we are reading from the same hymn book. Is that the sentiment that you got uh, when you appeared before Parliament recently where you basically had to reiterate that uh, the South African Reserve Bank has a mandate and its mandate is price stability but also justifying other matters that are outside of your office? I don't have to justify matters that are outside of uh, our office. Uh, we have got to uh, stick uh, in our name mm -hmm. the constitution uh, uh, tasks us with a particular responsibility of uh, price stability, but the constitution also says that we shall do other things that are also done by other central banks, mm -hmm. but those things that we must do, we have got to be empowered to do that, they have got to be in legislation, so we have got the National Payments uh, Act, which uh, gives us the power to run the national payment systems, the Banks Act and the Financial Sector Regulations mm. Act give us the responsibility to make sure that the financial sector is uh, uh, prudential, prudently uh, 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 run and that it protects the users of the financial uh, services. And so that is what uh, we do. I appreciate mm. that South Africans look at the Reserve Bank 
and they say the Reserve Bank has been successful in doing what we have asked it to do. Maybe we should be asking the Reserve Bank to do more. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, that says that society might be having an inflated view of what central banks are capable of doing. Central banks have been created for a purpose and they must be left to serve that purpose. Mm. There are other institutions in society that are tasked with particular responsibilities. If those institutions fail, we have got to be asking questions why those institutions fail instead of trying to burden mm. the institution that is successful in executing what society has tasked, itself, uh, tasked it with. You mentioned that uh, the banking industry in South Africa has shown some sort of resilience, uh, even in the face uh, of uh, us as consumers uh, not being able to keep up uh, with uh, the rising cost of living, uh, you know, repurposing and uh, mortgaging our homes because of the interest rates are going up. Your satisfaction levels uh, with regards to the South African banking system, that has been lauded along with the, the work of the South African Reserve Bank across the globe. Uh, the banking system has served South Africa well. Uh, elsewhere in the advanced economies, in the period around 2007 to 2008, taxpayers had to put money in the banking system because the banks were collapsing. South African taxpayers didn't have to put money in the South African banks because the South African banks are well run, mm and they are well regulated and well supervised. What we have seen now, when you are talking about mortgages and all of that, is that banks are starting to experience losses. Mm. Um, uh, when I'm saying losses, and it's, it's not that they are not profitable, they are still profitable, but they are, they are losses to the extent that interest rates have risen, and there are people who can no longer afford to service their mortgages or service mm. their cars. And those people either have to part with their cars or part with their houses or fall back with their things. Those losses get reflected in the declining profits mm. uh, of, uh, of the banks. But South African banks have got adequate buffers to be able uh, to, uh, to, absorb, uh, to absorb that. And so it is a banking system that has uh, served South Africa well and continues to serve yeah. um, uh, South Africa well. I asked earlier about uh, the makeup of the Monetary Policy Committee as we wrap up. And uh, recently, um, on a trip abroad, uh, you made a casual comment to say that uh, when you walk the streets of South Africa, it's no longer high, Governor, because interest rates were lower. Now it's here he goes again. <laughs> Your tenure... It's seemingly one of the most difficult in terms of the economic times that we find ourselves in. But uh, talk us through what uh, keeps you awake at night. Um, <laughs> what keeps me awake at night is inflation. Mm -hmm. um, inflation is eroding the income of South Africans. And um, uh, the South African Reserve Bank has got to be on top of its game in uh, tackling uh, uh, inflation. Um, the authors of our constitution understood this too well, that um, price stability is a necessary condition for balanced and sustainable growth in South Africa. Mm -hmm. But it is by no way a uh, sufficient condition for balanced and sustainable growth. And as such, it is important that all the other institutions in society that are responsible for areas that would spur economic growth mm. are actually brought to the fore. And we had consistently been raising the issue about structural reforms uh, in South Africa because it is that that would lift the potential growth of the uh, South African economy. And we should actually be staying uh, focused uh, on that. Thank you so much for your time and indulging us. Uh, that is uh, Reserve Bank Governor Lisa Kanyaho talking to us uh, on the business desk uh, this morning about a number of issues, including monetary policy, the stuff that pinches our pockets, and that's where we leave it.